أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله Inshallah, in this final session on uh, this surah, what we're going to start with is some qualities of the phrase فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ Just that part of it. And some very powerful benefits that come from it. First, understand the difference between hamd and tasbih, basically. The word sabbih comes from the word tasbih. Tasbih is to declare Allah's perfection. To keep it simple in your minds, tasbih, the purpose of it is to declare Allah's perfection, to declare Him above and beyond any flaws. Hamd in the Arabic language is two things. Is to declare Allah's uh, uh, great, great oh, sorry, uh, gratitude to Allah and appreciation of Allah. So praise and gratitude combined. When we praise and show thanks to Allah, that's hamd. When we declare His perfection, it is tasbih. So th- those two things. Now Allah says, فَسَبِّحْ bihamdi. So He combined tasbih with hamd. And He combined it with the let- letter ba, bihamdi. So what does the meaning come out to be? The first of them. أي قل سبحان الله والحمد لله متعجبا مما أراك من عجيب أنعامه أي إجمع بينهما. It means say سبحان الله والحمد لله. You know how we say in the phrase سبحان الله والحمد لله. We say that we say the perfection of Allah and we say the hamd of Allah. So he's saying سبح بحمد. Declare the perfection along with saying the hamd of Allah. So say both of them together. This is used in Arabic. For example, شربت الماء باللبن. I met, I drink water with milk. What that means is I drank water and milk. So they can use ba to, to do both. So that's one meaning of it, meaning say subhanallah, walhamdulillah. Thanian, إِذَا حَمِدْتَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ سَبَّحْتَهُ If you do hamd of Allah, it actually already means that you've declared His perfection. In other words, the meaning would be, declare Allah's perfection, that is to do hamd of Allah. In other words, doing hamd of Allah means you're already declaring Allah's perfection. How so? لِأَنَّ التَّسْبِيحِ دَاخِلٌ فِي الْحَمْدِ Because tasbih, declaring Allah's perfection, is included in showing Allah praise and gratitude. لِأَنَّ الثَّنَاءَ عَلَيْهِ وَالشُّكْرُ لَهُ لَا بُدْ وَأَنْ يَتَضَمَّنْ تَنْزِيهَا عَنِ النَّقَائِسِ It's only, you know, when you praise someone and you show him gratitude, by praising Allah and by thanking Him, we've already declared that He has no flaws. And you only praise something that does someone or something that doesn't have flaws to begin with. So the second meaning becomes, Declare the perfection of Allah by means of doing His hamd. That's the way you declare perfection of Allah because it's one and the same thing. Then the third is أن تكون هذه الباء هي التي في قولك فعلت هذا بفضل الله. This is important again. That ba could be in the meaning of by means of or actually because of because of. So what he's saying then is that declare Allah's perfection because all praise and gratitude belong to Allah. Because Allah is worthy of hamd, that it should be enough reason for you to say subhanallah. So subhanallah becomes the reason, the reason for it becomes alhamdulillah. Because that is a fact, that's a reality. That praise and gratitude belong to Allah, and that should make you declare His perfection. أَنْ يَكُونَ حَالًا أَيْ سَبِّحْ حَامِدًا Means it could, be, it could be an adverbial phrase. What that means simply is, when you declare Allah's perfection, have an attitude of someone who appreciates the favors of Allah. So have the attitude of someone who is appreciative when you say subhanallah. So bihamdi, bihamdi rabbi could be about the attitude of the one saying it. So don't just say the words, have the attitude of someone who truly appreciates Allah and is grateful to Him. And takuna al sila zaida wa yakuna al taqdir sabbih hamda rabbik. This is the final and most important, in my opinion at least, wallahu a'lam, that the final meaning is the ba could be zaid. What that simply means is, in, in practical English, declare Allah's perfection. Declare Allah's perfection, but in addition, perfect the way you do hamd of Allah. So tasbih, sabbih means to perfect. Perfect the way in which you do hamd. So better and better and better your salah. Better and better and better your dhikr of Allah. So that's the final implication of sabbih bi hamdi. And then finally, rabbik. Rabbik, your master of course. The ka referring to the messenger. And the word rabbi we've discussed, discussed many times before. Al-Malik, wal-Sayyid, wal-Murabbi, wal-Mun'im, wal-Qayyim. All these meanings. The one who's in charge and control. The one who gives gifts. And the word rabb here is important. Because you know, when you are victorious. Because the messenger has been given victory. But if anybody else is given victory, they think of themselves in charge. But he's being told immediately. Now that you have victory, who's in charge? 
Ya Rabb, remember him, subhanAllah, it's perfectly mentioned here. Then, innahu kana tawwaba. Just some benefits of tawwab and we'll, we'll tie the whole surah together inshaAllah. Allah says the word kana, innahu kana tawwab. He didn't say innahu tawwab, he says innahu kana tawwab. And he mentions it in the past tense. A rough translation will be, it is only he that is no doubt, ha- it, is, it is he who has been accepting of repentance. He has been continually accepting of repentance. Tawwab is different from ta'ib in Arabic. Tawwab means someone who comes back over and over and over again. Meaning he turns back to you and accepts your tawbah, turns back again and accepts your tawbah, turns back again and accepts your tawbah. But he mentions not of his ad- this attribute in the present, but alludes to it in the past. He has always been this way. So what's the benefit of alluding to it in the past? Especially because when we think of tawbah, we think of something that should happen in the future. Okay, he accepted tawbah in the past, but we're actually hoping he accepts the one I'm making now in the future, right? So what's the benefit of mentioning it in the past? The first is that I, haven't you seen what I've done in the past? As the ulama comment about this ayah. Didn't you see I accepted the tawbah of Bani Israel after they did shirk with me? If I can accept their tawbah, then you are the messenger of Allah. Your tawbah is far more acceptable. So I have been accepting of far bigger, worse criminals and when they make tawbah, so your tawbah is clearly acceptable. And by the way, in the context of this surah, people enter into the deen of Islam, right? They, they entered into the deen of Allah. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ Accepting Islam is a kind of tawbah. Accepting Islam is tawbah from shirk, it's tawbah from kufr, it's tawbah from, what you were in ja- from jahiliyyah, from darkness. And I have accepted all these people's tawbah, so I have been that way and my doors are still open. So that's the benef- one benefit of ka- kana. The other is it's a show of love to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's being asked to make istighfar and Allah is saying, by the way, I have already accepted your tawbah. Even before you make istighfar, I have already been. Kana tawwaban, I've already had your tawbah accepted. You should still make istighfar. In other words, this is a gift given to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The sha'ir, the poet says, لَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ فِي مَا مَضَى كَذَلِكَ يُحْسَنْ فِي مَا بَقَى In other words, Allah has already excelled in what already happened then we can only expect the same from him in what remains in the future. Now we come to the last and probably in my opinion the most important part of this dars of the surah. What ties the surah together? How these, these two messages come together? The first message of the surah was the victory of Islam. The second message of the surah is tasbih and hamd and istighfar specifically directed to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's look at these connections bit by bit. I have seven things to share with you. The first of them, at tasbih wa tathir. Tasbih is a means of purification. Tasbih is purification. Now that the house of Allah has been purified of idols, now it is the time to purify the hearts as well. This is the per- perfect time to purify the hearts as well. So one is the purification happening on the outside, the other is a call for purification of what is inside. The fa makes it very clear, the fa in the ayah, fa sabbih bihamdi, fa sababiya. In other words, because the things that have happened, the victories that have come, because of them you should make tasbih, so the two have been connected. Now, I was thinking when victory comes, the words I was expecting was fashkur, be grateful. You know, when something good happens, you thank Allah. But Allah said, make tasbih, declares hamd, and do istighfar. Three things. And He said it specifically to His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And I told you before, this commandment was given to the Messenger before. Wa'bud rabbak hatta ya'tiyak al right? Enslave yourself to your master until conviction comes to you, until death comes to you. The Messenger specifically is being told to busy himself in these things. And ulama comment, to make, the, make himself busy in these things so that he can continually make dua for his ummah. So, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ لِأُمَّتِكْ لَكْ وَلِأُمَّتِكْ So, for yourself and for your ummah. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Make istighfar for the believers. Ask Allah to forgive them. Then, you know, normally in any other scenario, I mentioned this in passing before, in any other scenario, victory is the time of great arrogance. Victory is the time to say, we did it. We did it. We accomplished it. Get time to give credit to yourself. People will come and congratulate you. In other words, victory is the time when egos are at their highest. And Allah is teaching us, just because you've destroyed idols on the outside, don't forget there's a worse idol inside your heart, and that is arrogance. And this is the time when that idol can be born. So kill that idol by declaring the perfection of Allah and asking istighfar of Him. If that thought even came in your head that we won, we got Him, we're on top, we're number one. If that attitude even came in your heart, get rid of it. Get rid of it, because that, those idols you can see, this is a more dangerous idol, you can't even see it, but it's there, it's a form of shirk. It is a form of shirk, arrogance is a huge thing, you know. 
So this is, this is the other shirk that's being destroyed. If the external means of shirk are being destroyed, make sure the internal means of shirk are also destroyed. SubhanAllah, he's using the messenger as a teacher SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then, uh, he, the, the next thing is fa'idha, this is very beautiful. You know Allah, was, Allah told his messenger SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, fa'idha faragta fansab, wa ila rabbika fargab. Fa'idha faragd. The, a messenger has to have two, converse, two missions. He has two missions. He has to communicate with Allah and he has to communicate with the people. He's got to do two things. And he wants to communicate, he communicates with Allah then he communicates with the people, which you would think he, he would rather do. If you have the option between communicating with Allah as a messenger, communicating with Allah or communicating with the people, definitely with Allah Azza wa Jal. Actually at the time of his parting, at the time of death, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma rafiq al-a'la, he called on Allah as the highest friend, the greatest friend. You know, at the time of death, everybody's thinking, I'm gonna miss my friends. I'm leaving everybody behind. And he's thinking, no, I'm finally gonna see my friend. SubhanAllah. He's, he's got a connection somewhere else. And you know, to, the way my teacher explained it to me, he compared it. He compared it to how, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, the, the same scenario happened with Musa alayhi salam. He was sp supposed to speak to, he got to speak to Allah, but then Allah told him, no, go talk to Fir'aun. <laughs> Which one would he rather talk to? Allah Azza wa Jal clearly. But now, why do you have to go talk to the people? Because your mission is not done. The mission is not done. The messengers are on a mission. And that mission can be very tough. The people will insult them, humiliate them, call them names. Now think about that. We hear this all the time, but we don't think about it, you know? You, you and I, we come from respectable families. We're respectable people. You may have respectable jobs. You don't, have, you don't go in a place where people use foul language against you and curse you and your family. When you're respectable and somebody says something inappropriate to you, Man, it ruins your whole day. Like if somebody cursed you out in a parking lot or something, or called you a name, you would be stressed out the entire day. They didn't hit you with anything, they didn't injure you, but people of dignity, the most painful thing is an attack on one's dignity. And the most noble people, you know, and I've seen people like that, when they have, somebody said something inappropriate at work to them. Slightly inappropriate. Man, they don't want to eat lunch, they're all depressed, they're not talking. What happened? Ah, oh, I don't want to talk about it, you know? They, they, they shrivel up. They shrivel up. The more noble you are, and the more soft-hearted you are, the more it hurts when somebody uses foul language against you. Now, on the other hand, if you're not a dignified person, and you're around people who use filthy language all the time, and somebody cusses you out, you're like, eh, and you cuss them back out, you know. You know, it doesn't make a difference to you. Now think about these messengers. These are the most noble of people. They're the most respectable people. They have the, you know, the cleanest tongues. And what kind of language do they get to hear from people against them? when they give this message, the kind of filthy language, the ridicule, the humiliation, the cursing, that they hear day in and day out, and then on top of that, attacks against their family, you know, constantly, you don't think it wears down on somebody's heart? You'd rather talk to them or talk to Allah? <laughs> but, the, but Allah says, no, go talk to them. Qum fa'anzir, go rise and warn them. You know, we just heard about Nuh I recited that on purpose. You know what happened when Nuh would go and make da'wah? They'd see him coming, you know what they would do? I don't want to hear it. Get lost. And then when he would get close to them, they would act like they're disgusted. Get away! Disgusting. Imagine somebody acts like that towards you. Oh my God. Filthy, you know. They acted like that with Nuh and he actually, and then he said, "That's not even the worst part." Was takbaro stikbara, and they were extremely arrogant towards me. He can't even put it in words yet; they're really arrogant towards me. The, the, the little things he did tell us, man, you can't even imagine somebody acting like that towards you. This is the conversation messengers have to engage in. And finally, in this surah, Allah tells His messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Your mission is done. You're finished." Now you get to do what you've been wanting to do all along. If you, give, if you give the messenger the option, he would be making istighfar to Allah, and hamd of Allah, and tasbih of Allah all along. He would, he would only be connected to Allah Azza wa Jalla, and Allah gives him that license. Now you go. Now we find, now it makes sense that the Sahaba say, as soon as the surah is revealed, what's the messenger doing always? Tasbih, he increases his salah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's constantly connected to Allah because now he's got the right to. Allah has given him that license. He finds his joy in salah. 
He finds his peace in salah. He finds his peace and, and happiness in remembering Allah Azza wa This is one thing I wanted to bring to your attention. The second and more sensitive thing that I wanted to bring to your attention in this dars, maybe I'll dedicate the next dars entirely to it, I don't know, but I'll at least introduce it now because we can't move to the next surah until we get this point across. There are two extremes in the Muslim ummah. In regards to the attitude we have towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the, one hand, on the one extreme, there are people who love him so much. They love him so much that they'll even do shirk in love of him. They will say things that should only be said about Allah, and then they'll say them out about the Messenger of Allah, and when you ask them, why are you saying that? And they'll say out of love. It is one extreme. On the other extreme, however, there are Muslim people who claim to be Muslims, who talk about Allah's Messenger, that the way they just talk about any other historical figure, Muslims. And they'll say very casual things about the messengers. Yeah, you know, the messengers, yeah, it's, it's just a hadith, or it's just, you know, it's not that important, or yeah, he gave us the Quran, but you know, we don't have to follow everything, or casually talking about the messenger of Allah, <laughs> just like they're talking about anybody else. This is a high crime, by the way. If, this, if you think shirk is a crime, this is also a high crime. This is a very serious matter. And the truth lies somewhere in between. And very few people have a, a balanced attitude in their relationship to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I bring this up for a reason. In this surah, Allah didn't just ask the Messenger to make tasbih and to make hamd. He also asked him to make istighfar. And you and I know istighfar is made for what? What is istighfar made for? For sins. And Allah mentions Himself as tawab. Allah has always accepted tawbah. And tawbah is done for what? When somebody makes a mistake, they make tawbah and then istighfar. So then the question arises, what has the Messenger done وسلم, that warrants the need for istighfar? I understand hamd and tasbih all the time. Then what is it that it warrants istighfar? And why is Allah saying He's going to accept tawbah? And by the way, the other surah of Fath, this is, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ What's the other surah of Fath? إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ there also, Allah Azza wa Jal said, لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهِ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ So Allah may cover for you whatever of... Ma I don't want to translate. I, it, it scares me to translate. Whatever of your thumb, I won't even translate. That you may have done and whatever may come in the future. I know common translations say sin. I don't like that word for the Messenger Wasallam. I'm scared <laughs> to use that word for Rasulullah Wasallam. What does it mean though, that Allah said He'll forgive the previous and the future? You know what, right? What, what does that mean? And what does it mean that Allah will accept istighfar? This is what we have to understand. Understand first of all, degrees. The first, the way, I want you to have an organized approach to understanding this problem. First of all, understand degrees. You know, there are different levels of people. There are different levels of people. There is someone who comes here for salah every day. And they are here even before the adhan. They're here before the adhan at fajr, they're here before the Adhan at Isha. And one day they get late. One day they, they come and they join the first rakah. Or they join the second rakah. They got late, they join the second rakah. You think they feel good or feel bad? They feel very bad that day. Man, I missed it. I missed best up. Then next to them is another person. And this person hasn't been to the masjid in six months. They live next door, but they haven't been here for six months. And they decide one day they're gonna come to they also join the second rakah. You think that guy feels good or feels bad? Man, this is, I, I, I did good today. People are at different levels. So for one, he's thinking, you know, this is sayyat al-abrar, hasanat, you know, <laughs> the nas really. The, 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 what the righteous people think of as a sin, the common person thinks of as a great accomplishment. This one is thinking, I messed up, astaghfirullah, la hawla wa quwwata, how did I miss it? And that one is thinking, man, may Allah reward me, I did really good today. Right? But for him it's a dhamb, for him it's a sin. Dhamb, by the way, that shouldn't be translated sin. Dhamb comes from the tail, the Arabic word dhanab, the tail of an animal. What, the tail of an animal is that which is, embarrasses it. Dhamb is something you do that embarrasses you. Now the same act is being done, but one is embarrassed by it, the other one's proud of it. You understand what I'm saying? When the Messenger والسلام, his act that disappoints him is still greater than the best thing we'll ever do. <laughs> There's difference in levels. At our level, what will be our greatest deed in our life would still probably be a thumb for him. It'll still, he's still that high up. 
So he, we're down here, he's up there, he goes from up there to here, and this is a thumb for him. Now, don't call that a sin. That would be a grave mistake to call that a sin. Now let me tell you what these dhunub are, just so you and I understand. Let me give you an example. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum comes to the messenger, blind sahabi, cousin of the, you know, the, the wife of the Prophet he comes to him. Messenger of Allah وسلم, is talking to somebody else. He's talking to a leader of Quraysh. And he starts interrupting the conversation. He's blind, but he's not what? He's not deaf. Does he hear a conversation is going on? He hears it. He still interrupts it. So who's being rude? Who's not being appropriate? First and foremost. Second of all, the messenger وسلم, didn't tell him, stop, I'm talking to someone. What did he do? Do you know what he did? Rasulullah sallallahu what did he do? Abasa. Ab you know what Abasa means? In English they translate it as frowned. You know what it actually means? It, it doesn't, frowning is this. This is frowning. You know what Abasa is? Abasa is that the, the bulge on your forehead appears but nothing else on your face is showing frustration. Just a slight little bulge on your forehead. The messenger is a little perplexed that he keeps interrupting the conversation. And he just turns slightly. He's not this. He just turns slightly, it's frustrating. And by the way, even if he turned, is he blind? Is Abdullah blind? Can he see it happen? So is he possibly offended? No. The Messenger والسلام, did nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. He didn't offend the Sahabi. Abbas. <laughs> but Allah Azza wa Jal has set such a high standard for His Messenger that even that, Allah said He shouldn't have done it. What is not a sin at all, for any of us, it is not a sin at all. But for the messenger, he has been placed on a much higher standard than we. So he comes and he, Allah Azza wa comes on him for that. And by the way, Allah Azza wa could have revealed the ayah. He could have revealed the ayah before it happened. Right? فَاسْتَمِعْ لَهُ Listen to him carefully. No. Allah waited till he turned a little bit and then he revealed the ayah. You know why? So we learn something. You know what we learn from this ayah? We learn that the only one only one who can criticize the Messenger of Allah is who? Allah Himself, that's it. No one else can criticize the Messenger of Allah. Which is why I get scared to use words like sin. We can't use those kinds of words. What is he making istighfar for? That's the question here. You know, some captives at Badr, some kuffar get captured at Badr. Umar bin al-Khattab, the Messenger says, what should we do with them? Umar bin al-Khattab says, we should kill all of them. I got a better idea. Get their family members who are Muslim to kill them so we know where they stand. Abu Bakr Siddiq comes and says, no, actually we should get them to teach us to read and write. And if they do that, we should set them free. So you got two options, huh? You, you got the Umar option, you got the Abu Bakr option. You take a wild guess, which one did Rasulullah SAW take? He took the Abu Bakr option. Rahmatul Alameen, it's got strategic benefits too. Their hearts will be softened to Islam. So many benefits. Nothing wrong with the decision. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the ayah in Surah Muhammad, saying you should have gone the Umar opinion. Now Allah could have revealed the ayah before. Right? He could have revealed the ayah before, but he revealed it after. Now, did the did the messenger disobey Allah Ma'adullah? No. Because he didn't do it after the ayah came, he did it. Before the ayah, and before the ayah, he made his decision based on the best knowledge that Allah had given him and the mercy that Allah had already put in his heart. Allah, oh, the only one who could have known better, the only one who could have heard those two opinions and said, no, Umar's got the better opinion. The only one who could give that answer is who? Allah, and he did. And Allah did, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, and look at the love Allah shows his messenger, sallallahu The munafiq comes to him. The munafiq comes to him and says, I'm not going in the battle of Tabuk. I can't go. Because the women there are so pretty. On the way there are villages and the women are really pretty. And I'm a player, I can't help myself. So I can't go into battle. I mean of all the lame excuses you're gonna come up with to not to go into battle. <laughs> right? And if this guy's coming up with such a lame excuse, it makes complete sense that he's probably gonna be a useless or even a liability on the battlefield anyway. So the smart thing to do is what? Okay, you stay home. In Surah At-Tawbah, Allah Azza wa says, عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ Allah has already forgiven you. لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ Why did you give them permission? Now that decision that Allah's Messenger made, that was a strategic decision. It was a strategic decision. But it wasn't an act of disobedience. Even that decision was an act of worship. 
But the, now here's what I want you to remember from this conversation. The messenger feels bad that Allah corrected. The messenger thinks of that as a sin. Is it actually a sin? No. But the messenger's level is so high that in his high standards, he thinks of it as a sin. So he feels the need to make istighfar. So Allah says, do what your heart has been telling you all along. Make istighfar. And by the way, by the way, why, why does he feel bad? Because you know all of these decisions that the Prophet made, I call them strategic decisions. The purpose of them is eventually to get victory of this deen. Did Allah give the victory already? He did. In other words, even if there was strategically a mistake, we don't, even the word mistake, I'm scared to use. But whatever decision wasn't the best, if such, such a decision was made, it might hurt the mission. So you know what Allah said in Surah Al-Fatih? He said, إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا we have given you the clear, a clear victory. Remember that from Hudaybiyah? What did he say after that? لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Whatever things you do that disappoint you, that you, every strategic move you made that you didn't like or that I corrected, that you did in the past or you did in the future is covered for, victory is guaranteed. وَيَنْصُرَكَ اللَّهُ نَصْرًا عَزِيزًا That Allah will aid you with an authoritative aid. Don't worry about it. And that's the surah, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ so this is the, you know, takrim, لِتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَقِّرُوهُ That you show honor to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa This is why it makes my heart heavy when somebody says, which translation do you recommend? I usually go to Surah Al-Fatih and see what they translated. Because you can't just take them and just translate heart, you know, sin and move on. You can't do that. You can't do that. And Allah in this surah told him, Make istighfar because that's what you love doing. And by the way, one of the most beloved deeds to Allah is what? Is istighfar. Sin or no sin, istighfar is beloved to Allah. That's why the Messenger does it. That's why the Messenger does it. And by the way, this is the final thing I will share with you in regards to this. The Messenger's mission, the Messenger's mission is to do what Allah tells him. That's his mission. Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was building the Kaaba, before he even started building, Allah Azza wa Jal told him, He gave him a graduation certificate. Inni ja'iluka lil nasi imama. I am making you imam over all people. And you have already, I've already tested you. He completed, passed all the tests. Ibrahim alayhi salam is guaranteed that he is passed all the tests and now he's commanded to build the house. And as they are building the house, he and Ismail alayhi salam, you know what they said? They said, وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا Part of their dua was, accept our tawbah. Tawbah from what? They're putting every brick together. But maybe one brick didn't place where Allah wants it to be. And I'm afraid of that. So I make tawbah to Allah. They're putting Allah's house together and they're thinking maybe they made some mistakes. So that should require their tawbah. What's the difference between the tawbah of a prophet and the tawbah of a believer and a Muslim? SubhanAllah, there's a world, there's a world of difference. World of, we make tawbah for watching that movie, or going yelling at the wife, or we make tawbah for missing salat because we overslept. We make tawbah for sins. They're called sayyiat. Look, read the beginning of Surah Al-Fatih. You know what we'll find? You'll find when the messenger is mentioned, dhamb is used. Because dhamb is what personally disappoints you. It's, not, it's based on levels. When the believers are mentioned, sayyiat is used. For the believers, sayyiat. SubhanAllah There's a difference in standards a Wide difference in standards That is being made clear to us And this is part of the kawthar Allah has given His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So this is the final thing I wanted to share with you a pre Acknowledging that when the Messenger makes istighfar That that in and of itself is not the same as your istighfar and mine And even when the Messenger feels like he did a sin It's not actually a sin He feels that way because his standard is so high He's that sensitive He's that sensitive. So he's making dua, maybe something was missing in my salah. Maybe something I could have done better. Something I may have missed. Maybe I didn't realize. He's constantly introspecting. And this is the attitude of Ibrahim alayhi salam. If you and I go to hajj, we say, man, subhanAllah, I made hajj. Ibrahim alayhi salam is building the Kaaba and saying, I don't know if I'm doing a good job, I make tawbah. Watub alayna. They're nervous. They want Allah to accept. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, please accept from us. We don't know if it's good enough, but please expect, accept it from us. This is the attitude we're supposed to have in our acts of ibadah. 
Because these, these messengers, especially our messenger وسلم, is asking Allah's istighfar not of sins in acts that he does to obey Allah. Maybe they're not as good as Allah wanted them to be and then he's asking Allah to, to make a, he's asking Allah's forgiveness for those. SubhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us a real love and honor for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah help us understand the Qur'an properly and live by it. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.